Hi, Eric. Hi, Henry. How are you? Very well. Well, at least better than I was. I have been suffering from a bad bronchial infection, and so if I start coughing uh, during the during the uh, next uh, 40 minutes or hour or however long we're going, it's not because I'm uh, wheezing with indignation at what you have to say. It's because I'm in recovery mode still. So I okay. guess we're... Uh, going to talk about it could your, be over determined. It could be both. I it, could, it, 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 it could be both. Maybe you'll, you'll uh, provo- provoke me into apoplexy. I think is the uh, technical term. <laughs> I'll here. try. Okay, do your best. So I guess we're here to talk about your uh, new book, which I'm just holding up to the camera, uh, complete with a uh, bunch of uh, little paper markers that I put in it at various places. Uh, the perils of global global legalism, which has just come out with the University of Chicago Press. So maybe we should start by talking for a little bit. Uh, maybe you can talk for a few minutes about the book, what it's arguing, who it's arguing against, and uh, what you hope to achieve with it. Okay. Uh, oh, and I, I'm not sure we – do we introduce ourselves? I'm Eric Posner, by the way, and um, I'm at the University of Chicago, and I've been, I've been writing about um, international law now for about 12 or 13 years. Um, and uh, and my background is is more in rational choice, uh, and, and and a colleague of mine then at Chicago, Jack Goldsmith, got me interested in international law. We wrote a book a while ago called The Limits of Global Legalism, which just tried to apply some simple rational choice theory to international law. Now, the book got um, a really hostile reception from law professors, which um, should not have surprised me, but I guess did a little bit and uh, was heavily criticized. So um, this book is a, is a kind of a sequel that tries to um, respond to the criticisms and uh, to think uh, maybe a little more deeply and philosophically about some of the issues that were raised about the earlier book, which is a pretty straightforward, you know, here's some simple game theory, how, how might it apply to international law. And in this, this, this book is more explicitly uh, critical of the prevailing view in international law scholarship. Now, um, international law scholarship is uh, heavily legalistic um, or doctrinal. Um, traditionally, it hasn't thought too much about the theoretical foundations of the subject, although that's been changing uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and what I think is the main problem with uh, uh, international law scholarship is precisely this legalism. And I don't think it's it's just international law scholarship. You see it a lot in, in public discussion as well. Um, now, by legalism, I mean um, a kind of excessive faith in the efficacy of law and uh, a belief that law and legal agents like judges should um, settle issues of public policy. Um, legalism has a long history in the United States uh, and uh, has been written about a great deal by uh, by political scientists and, um, to a lesser extent, lawyers. And it's a fascinating phenomenon, one that's always interested. But the book, um, this book is about what I call global legalism, which is just legalism applied uh, at the global stage. Now, what is global legalism? As I said before, it, 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 can, it starts off as just very simply this idea that international law can solve problems that it, in fact, cannot solve. Um, what's special about the global, um, global legalism is, that, is the weakness of international institutions. So legalism in the United States and other legalist countries works as well as it does, in fact, because there's an enormous, complex, powerful array of government institutions that support the law in various ways. Judges get the law wrong, it can be corrected, judges can be replaced. Uh, I can go into detail about that. But at the international stage, as, as is well known, and, and this is hardly a new point, um, there is no world government. There, the the, the uh, global institutions are very weak, with the result that international law is very weak. Um, but that doesn't mean that international law doesn't exist. That's certainly not my argument. It's just that it's very weak, and, and, it, and it's better understood as the norms that arise from relatively simple forms of cooperation between states. What puts limits on it is the simple problem of collective action. There are a lot of states. Uh, there are terrible global problems that it's very difficult <coughs> to uh, solve through cooperation. And... Um, uh, um, um, 
but the the problem is is that people who who who've been by now you know been more or less persuaded that government world government is not in the horizon have uh have put their faith into international law as a kind of free floating um solution to the world's problems without thinking carefully about what exactly are the mechanisms that ensure that states and people in some cases comply with uh, international law Okay. Why don't I stop there, Henry, and, and see if you have any particular okay. questions. Okay. Well, you know, obviously this is going to be an extremely boring blogging heads if we uh, agree on things uh, too much. But let me just start out before I get into the disagreements by talking about the places where we basically, uh, basically Henry, agree. Henry, are you still there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the places where we basically agree on stuff. And I guess uh, when I look at this stuff, I'm not, uh, I am not a sort of hardcore rational choice person, but I do tend to uh, start from the uh, presupposition that rational choice is a very useful way to understand these problems, to understand uh, how institutions, including legal institutions, arise. I also believe uh, I'm an international relations scholar. I believe that state interests have to figure very powerfully into whatever explanations you want to come up with. But uh, I do think that uh, one could make the argument, and this is to start with the uh, theoretical side of your uh, approach, I think that one could make the argument that rational choice is by no means necessarily as hostile to the uh, kinds of, uh, to, to at least some of the aims of global legalism as I think the book suggests. You know, so if I give, here's one example, uh, which is on page, um, let's see, page 29 of your book. Uh, you state, uh, some international law emerges spontaneously as custom, but when states seek to solve global collective action problems, they can only do so by creating treaties. A state can only be bound by a treaty if it consents to it. Thus, a treaty that will solve a global collective action problem requires the consent of all states or of all states that contribute to that problem. Uh, I think this is, to me at least, is a, a considerable overstatement of what rational choice theorists would actually say about this stuff. And here I'm talking, for example, Russell Harden has this... Uh, Account and Collective Action, one of his, uh, one of the original books on the uh, field that I think you indeed cite, uh, the, that, that more or less argues you don't have to have everybody agreeing in order to uh, solve a collective action problem, where you, uh, all you need is you need sufficient uh, actors agreeing and being prepared to contribute resources to uh, sort of cover the shortfalls from other actors who aren't prepared to uh, who aren't prepared to uh, to cooperate in a particular situation. So, in other words, you don't need unanimity, which I think is really the uh, burden of the argument that you're trying to put forward here. And this, I think, is reinforced when you look at the international arena by people like Todd Sandler, who have these really very sophisticated analyses of all of these very different collective action problems that you may face in the international realm. Some of them indeed require unanimous uh, unanimous uh, action on behalf of all uh, states involved, but a lot of them do not. And, uh, and so I think that the difficulties of solving collective in international uh, or collective action problems at the international level are maybe somewhat ex exaggerated uh, in the particular version of rational choice that you're presenting here. Well, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure we disagree about this. I, I mean, so let's, yeah. let's take the case of, there, see, the, the different as Sandler and, and others have made, have, have, have argued, there are different types of strategic problems that states face. And um, some types of problems are, you know, rel are, 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 you know, pure public goods, but only involve a few actors. So, so let's suppose that we have a number of states that um, border on a lake and there's a fishery in the lake. And uh, let's just say it's three or four states. And... Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they could enter into a treaty that would allow them to exploit the fishery efficiently rather than, rather than overfishing it. There's only a few states there. Or consider um, a global problem which really involves, let's say, coordination more than um, uh, the, the sort of pure public good situation. And people have talked about this uh, in, in your field for a, a long time, but, but communication and transportation standards are, are an example. Where, uh, for example, um, uh, there, there, are, there are various um, equally good ways of communicating, but the states have to agree on a single wavelength or, or group of wavelengths uh, for, the, for their communications. And 
it's it's not a very difficult. It might be hard at the bargaining stage to to agree, but once an agreement is in place, it's not very hard for the states to um, to uh, to comply with the agreement because it's in your own self interest. And if you want to communicate, to to stick to to whatever uh, uh, you you agreed to. Um, and then there are problems sort of that are sort of in between that you know may or may not uh, be solvable. And and my you know my claim isn't that any type of cooperation is impossible. But the focus of the book are, are the big problems, the big global problems, uh, climate change, uh, disease, uh, the spread of disease, war, um, those sorts of things. And uh, they do need um, treat. They do require treaties that in, that uh, involve the uh, participation of you know pretty much all states or or, or, or very large number of states. Th- those are the ones that I worry about. And I don't, you know. There are, you know, kind of models in game theory where, where in, in fact, everybody ends up cooperating because everybody promises to punish everybody who who cheats and to punish those who fail to punish, and and so those things are all theoretically um, theory, theoretically possible. But in, in practice, it's hard to believe that the empirical conditions uh, exist for allowing that type of cooperation because it requires an enormous amount of information. Um, that, that just doesn't uh, exist in the world. That's that's why these institutions are, are built in the first place. So I'm not saying that international law yeah. is impossible, or even very ambitious types of international law are impossible on rational choice premises. I, I just think the type the types of international law that international law professors argue for um, are uh, I'm, I'm more skeptical about about those types of international law. And partly, I, I would say I'm, I'm making a methodological point, which is just that mm-hmm. if you want to propose something new, you know, like a landmines treaty or a international criminal court, the burden should be on the uh, academic or scholar or whoever who, who proposes it to explain how, in fact, uh, this uh, this institution is, in, in the jargon of economists, incentive compatible. That is why it would be in the interest of states to, to comply with it. But that's really been missing um, in the literature. Okay, but uh, I guess to uh, push back in a certain sense, so you could interpret your uh, criticisms in one of two ways. One, that the global legalist uh, uh, approach to this stuff is fundamentally and effectively impossible because of problems that are revealed by rational choice theory. The second is that uh, global legalists, as you say, tend to be somewhat allergic to rational choice theory and that they might come up with better and more plausible accounts of the kinds of stuff that global legal rules can or cannot do if they paid more attention to uh, incentive inca- compatibility. That seems to be more what you're arguing right there. Is that a correct yeah. uh, understanding? Yeah. Yes. And I don't yeah. want. I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a doctrinaire, a rational choice person yeah. either. I think in the end, um, everything depends on uh, you know empiricism. So you know, again, I, I'm criticizing people who. Who don't mm-hmm. try very difficult <laughs> people who 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 do not use rational choice, but and, and and propose different theories, but don't try very hard to test them empirically. Um, and so I'm willing to be persuaded by uh, by uh, empirical testing, uh, but 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 I haven't seen it uh, at least not in the uh, in the international law literature, and at least uh, you know I have looked, I have read in the political science literature, and I'm just skeptical about some of the uh, of the efforts in that literature um, so that, that that's the the, the, the the book is probably best understood as a, as a plea for skepticism and it, and it's motivated more by um, history you know a sense that if you look back throughout history international law has been very weak and the question is you know what accounts for the sudden enthusiasm for it is this enthusiasm for it based on reason uh, you know evidence, uh, a good sense of what mechanisms are available, or is it just a kind of enthusiasm which we've seen in the past at various periods, but but has always, uh, you know, not ended up being very productive? Now, this also seems to me to be somewhat different from your earlier arguments with Jack Goldsmith. So I'll confess that I haven't read the book, but I did read a piece which I think went into the book, which effectively argued that international law was cheap talk. In other words, that it was uh, something which was really... Uh, not going to have any uh, sort of measurable uh, implications uh, whatsoever, except under some relatively unusual circumstances for the ways in which actors actually behaved. 
everybody pretended that they lived up to uh, international law. Nobody had any incentive to actually change their behavior, uh, change their behavior because of the uh, specific equilibrium and game theoretic terms that they were at. Is that something that you still believe, or is that something well, that you're modified? yeah, I don't. I, I, you know, I, a lot of people have accused me of, of saying this, and maybe that paper was, was just badly written because th that's not my view, and I don't, I don't, I wouldn't have interpreted the paper as saying that. The paper went into the book. I, I don't think the the book says that. Um, well, let me say a few things about it. So, as you know, but as our viewers might not know. Uh, cheap talk doesn't necessarily mean ineffectual talk. You know, it arose in the literature precisely because it turns out that the cheap it talk sometimes can has actually, right? You, you know this, yeah. but but I'm not sure our yeah. viewers know this. That that cheap talk actually can, uh, you know, be very important, and it actually comes out of this. I, I don't know how much detail we should go into this, but. Uh, in, in the economics literature, this, this first idea called signaling is that you know people can engage in certain actions that reveal information about them, and as a result of that, other people will change their behavior in certain ways, and meaningful outcome can can be produced. And then some people say, well, what if you just talk? You know, what if I tell you that I'm an honest person without actually doing something that only honest people can do? You know, like offering a warranty backed up by money. And um, and you know, I think the first instinct was. Well, that's meaningless. You should never believe someone who just says, I I'm honest. But but the people who came up with the cheap talk models pointed out, well, sometimes in certain strategic situations, when you actually just say something, it, it it's meaningful. So, for example, if I'm, you know, if I'm walking down the street and I, or I would say I'm on my bicycle and I, and I say to somebody coming the other way, I'm, I'm passing on your right, the person has every reason to believe me because we don't want to crash. It's in our mutual interest not to crash. And this has been applied in a wide range of circumstances. And I, and I think political scientists in the past, it's been a while since I've looked at this, have, have used these sort of cheap talk models as well to talk about certain aspects of international law. Okay, so when I say cheap talk, I, I realize that, that to the person who doesn't understand the literature, um, you know, that might sound like I'm saying, because it sounds uh, derogatory, that might sound like I'm saying international law doesn't do anything. I, I don't think that. The real point of the book was to argue that often when we look at international law, which is understood to be multilateral by the legalists, by international law professors, it actually, it actually often turns out really to be bilateral, which, which has always struck me as um, consistent with uh, game theory. And the particular uh, puzzle that that paper was motivated by was this criticism. Well, if it's all just self-interest, why do people often say that international law is not really about self-interest, that nations will say, well, you know, we've got a, an obligation, and, and nations will rarely say, well, we're just acting in our self-interest. Um, and, the, and the paper tried to grapple with that problem, maybe not in a, in a satisfactory way, but the, but the basic point of the paper was to try to explain why nations uh, do not just say we're acting in our self-interest all the time, and that's why we're going to violate the, the, this treaty. It was not at all a, a claim that international law doesn't exist or just uh, happens to coincide with what anybody was going to do anyway. Okay, so if you were to think about this from the perspective of one of the people that you disagreed with, say, for example, one of the international global legalists who you disagree with decides to uh, tech themselves up with game theory mm -hmm. and uh, actually begins to do this stuff in a serious way, what kinds of things, what, what kind of uh, model do you think that I'm sort of a global legalist could come up with on the basis of rational choice micro foundations? What do you think is the strongest possible case that somebody could make if they took account of the things that uh, you say that they need to take account of? Yeah, I think they and they you know I think to some extent they, they understand this is that you, you you want to penetrate the shell of the of the state. So in, in a lot of these models, the the state is considered an agent with interests and and so forth and. Of course, the state is just a fiction. It's an aggregation of the interests of the various people who operate it and vote and, and all the rest. And uh, some kind of model that uh, that that uh, you know goes back go, really goes to micro foundations, as you say, and looks at individuals and interest groups and so forth uh, is probably the, the way to go. Um, people have uh, not not the people I'm criticizing, but other people in the political science literature and the economics uh, literature have have done this. Uh, um, to some extent, but 
but even the models, at least that I'm familiar with, don't get you very far. Like probably the, the most influential and important are the models in, that are used for international trade where people imagine, um, uh, you know, the import competing groups having a particular interest and the exporters having a particular interest and both of them lobbying the government and the government just, you know, aggregating their preferences and so forth. But, you know, even these models don't get you very far because, of course, sometimes it's the, in the interest of ordinary people and groups to violate international law as well as to comply with it. And this collective action problem that bothers me is, um, you know, goes all the way down. Um, so, so my guess is that rational choice isn't going to get you very far. I could be wrong. You know, someone could come up with something. My guess is that rational choice is not going to get you very far. And uh, and that maybe some other theoretical tradition would be more useful uh, for trying to uh, explain, you know, how 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 a more robust form of international law is possible. But of course, my whole agenda here is to explain why international law is not is not robust, and and so that's why these rational choice premises appeal to me. They seem to make sense out of uh, out of what we observe. Well, maybe there's a difference between uh, legal scholars and political scientists. You know, so effectively, you're, what you're you've just said, you're arguing for a position of considerable skepticism in general about global legalism, and this is certainly the way you present the evidence. Uh, it's uh, You say that uh, you think that international law can have some consequences, but you present the evidence in, sort of, uh, in, in ways that conduct towards a general skepticism about the kinds of things that international law really can do on a general basis, whereas the people who you're arguing against uh, in your presentation, I've got to say I've not read them anywhere near as closely as I should have, uh, uh, that they, uh, the, I've, read, I've, I've skimmed a couple of articles in preparation for this, uh, uh, but, but on your account, that they are pre presenting a general case for sort of the application of law on the global level. As a political scientist, what I would be interested in is uh, not so much an argument uh, for or against uh, global legalism as a, a more specific uh, uh, empirical account of what are the conditions under which international laws do or do not work, what are the, the uh, what are the ways in which we can identify the um, sort of the enabling empirical conditions? And this seems to me to be uh, somewhat uh, uh, not exactly removed from the kind of agenda that you're uh, talking about here, or that the people you're arguing about are talking about here. But at least you know sort of on a um, sort of a, 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 you know on a different plane, a different way of thinking about this stuff. That was the focus of the first book. Um, the, the first book was was more of a I mean, you know, you political scientists have a lot of interests, <laughs> and, and uh, the legalism idea comes from Judith Schwar, a political scientist, but it's more of a philosophical, I guess a kind of a philosoph more from the philosophical side of political science. Um, the, uh, but the, the original, the, the earlier book did this. This, this, this book does it in some, in some of the chapters, I think, although, although you might disagree, but mm -hmm. as I was saying earlier about the first book, you know, the basic claim was that when we look around at international law, uh, we see uh, various degrees of cooperation. And a lot of these the most important treaties are explicitly universal treaties or, or nearly universal. So the human rights treaties, for example, and the trade treaty, the WTO <laughs> to, some ex to some extent. And, and the question, and, and when people um, argue for a more... Um, ambitious types of international law, they often cite these treaties. They say, well, look, the WTO is, you know, solving a, a, some, a global collective action problem. Why can't we have an international criminal court to, to solve another one? Um, but the, my view of the WTO is that, you know, basically it relies very heavily on, on a bilateral mechanism, that uh, although there, are, there is a kind of multilateral aspect to it, it, it doesn't, that part doesn't really have any coercive force. And what's going on is that you have pairs of states uh, that basically cooperate with each other using the WTO in, in, in relatively limited ways. And that's built into the very structure of trade law, which only gives you as a remedy a, a self-help self -help remedy. Although, now, although, just on a purely tactical point, uh, my mm -hmm. understanding is one way in which that is being alleviated, perhaps uh, in unintended fashions, is, is the intro introduction of uh, intellectual property law into the WTO, which effectively means that smaller states can, uh, can, for example, retaliate more effectively against the United States by seeking derogations from intellectual property law 
uh, so that they can sort of copy movies or uh, copy sure, music. Sure, sure. And, so, you know, and, that, so and that's just which, a way of saying yeah. that states yeah. that at first seem weak turn out actually not to be weak, right? That, that they turn out to have really quite um, a, quite a, a strong uh, stick that they can whack uh, uh, the, the powerful countries with. The, the apparently powerful countries with right so um, so but 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 that just means for example you know so th- that that means yeah that you that you have certain types of bilateral bilateral cooperation that turn out to be more robust uh, than they might otherwise be it's not it, they might otherwise be it's not really a, a way to um, uh, to solve the collective action problem and so just just to finish um, in, in the, in the, then in the first book I say so what are the conditions of global cooperation the question you ask well you know when you have two states that have, you know, certain interests and they're able to cooperate and maybe something like a repeated prisoner's uh, dilemma, but it's very hard when you look around to find truly successful uh, examples of, of cooperation that involves more than a, a handful of states and, and a pure public good as, as opposed to, to uh, you know, communication standards, which can be understood in, in terms of coordination games. That being the case, that doesn't mean it's impossible, of course. You can't prove that it's impossible. But that being the case, you know, one should be skeptical about, um, uh, let's say, uh, international criminal law or the international human rights treaties, for that matter, which really do deal with a a problem of global collective action. You look at those treaties, they're not particularly effective. And and there's been a lot of empirical research now Mainly in the political science research, the uh, political science literature, which suggests that they don't really have very much effect on uh, on the behavior of state. Now, th- this is pretty simple stuff, it seems to me. Um, it may be wrong, of course, but it's a it's a straightforward theoretical argument, and uh, and there's straightforward ways to test it empirically. But it's not the sort of stuff that people ever do in inter- in international law. Now, when you move to global legalism, the the point is so we law professors are. are the, the the gods of the academic universe for some reason allow us uh, to make normative arguments, whereas you guys, I guess, aren't supposed to, in, 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 at least in your academic endeavors. But when we turn to the normative side, you know, that just makes me worry about a lot of the uh, the most ambitious uh, types of, of international law. First, that the existing forms are, are m- misunderstood, that people read into them what they hope uh, is going on, rather than actually looking at them and seeing what actually is going on. And second of all, people make very ambitious arguments about what international law can accomplish, which is not really based on, it seems to me, a reasonable theoretical uh, and empirical analysis of what's happened in the past. Okay, well, I guess uh, to push back at some of this, it would seem to me an international, you know, and here I'm uh, imagining myself into the head of this uh, putative global legalist who actually uh, starts to read the literature on rational choice and to try to respond to you, it seems to me that there are two possible responses which this person could make, or two ways of responding. First response is to say, well, okay, but if you look at the uh, ways in which uh, rational choice works when people are engaged in kind of uh, relationships that go on for an indefinite period of time, uh, the rational choice literature says pretty well anything can go that you have this uh, problem of the folk theorem, which says there are massive numbers of equilibria. In in effect, you can be in a situation where there are many, many, many possible outcomes, and where you have a whole bunch of uh, work, uh, uh, Avner Greif, uh, Randy Calvert, other people who say that very, very complex institutional forms can indeed uh, sort of spring up purely on the basis of self-interest alone, and, you know, so including under relatively reasonable parameter conditions, several hundreds of actors or thousands of actors, more than enough to include the, uh, the state system. And so you could argue on that basis that you could see something which uh, would clearly be limited in some ways by, by the you know, sort of basic need for self-interest, by the need for uh, threats to be enforceable and whatever, but that you could actually see conditional cooperation leading to some relatively substantial international institutions. That's one way in which you could argue. Second way in which you could argue would be to look at the uh, basis of interests themselves. And this is something where I, I, uh, I was looking through the uh, book to try and find a statement of where you think interests actually come from. And you talk at one stage about narrow self-interests. You talk about the problems of trying to come up with a good theory of interests, of state interests, and this is something which I know, which is an enormous problem for international relations theorists. Uh, Dan Dresner is somebody who I've engaged back and forth in dialogue with about this. Uh, but you don't have 
a very strong theory of uh, that, at least that I can see, of what interests actually are. And the second theory, the possible theoretical angle that somebody might take, would be to say, well, really what we need to think about is to uh, change state self-interest or their conception of their self-interest in ways that make it more congenial for them to cooperate internationally and in ways that reduce some of the uh, diversity and clashes that you, I think, correctly identify as a major problem for uh, cooperation in the international system. Uh, you talk at one stage about how it is uh, that you know, so we would never accept, uh, expect Sweden to engage in genocide in the first place, so that the uh, response of somebody like Harold Coe might be, well, why don't we see ways in which we can plausibly make at least some countries in the world more like Sweden than they used to be? And uh, indeed, I think you quote something. You At, at one stage, on um, page 74, you quote him as saying that uh, he believes that... Uh, that, that border agreements may actually cause governments to cooperate when they no longer have an interest in doing so. But the actual quote that you give, if you go back to the uh, footnote, seems to be more of a um, sort of quote where uh, Co is basically saying not that they're necessarily going to act against their, uh, their, the state's interest, but the state's understanding of its interest is going to be transformed. And so I think in order to push back against this kind of argument, you need to have a, uh, a very clear argument as to why state, uh, state self-interest is relatively static, stable, saying why it's fixed. Uh, and maybe you have that theory, but at least I, I am certain seem to, to find it in my, in my reading of that book. Uh, yeah, those are, those are both good questions. Let me start with the first. Uh, I, I guess my, my, my short answer is, you know, Henry, you know, write, the, write this paper. Um, no one has. If you take someone like Greif, you know, with, with Greif, Avner Greif is a you know, distinguished um, economic historian, I think, at Stanford. He, what he does in his paper, he doesn't just try to say, well, you know, there's, there's this, this inter- interesting type of cooperation involving people over long distances, a large number of people trading and so forth. He doesn't just say, you know, here's, here's a model that, that shows that, in fact, this type of robust cooperation is consistent with their self-interest. What he does is he tries to write a model which shows both, you know, why this worked and then eventually why it failed. Right, so so he has a he has a much more fine grained mo- uh, model, and somebody has to produce that for international law. Some of the reactions to my other work was just to to say, well, look, we, you know, we can come up with you know rational choice models where states care a lot about their reputations or, or what have you, and you know, voila, we've got lots of international cooperation. But the fact is, empirically, you know, sometimes we have international cooperation, sometimes we don't, and. And what needs to be explained is the pattern. That, that's why in this earlier book, you know, I wanted to say, well, here's the pattern, bilateral or, you know, small number of states, that seems to work sometimes. Larger number of states, that doesn't seem to work much. Um, but I'm sure there, there's a much more sophisticated pattern, and, and some, but somebody has to actually come up uh, with, with the model. You know, I, I can't, you know, I can only take one step, and who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly open uh, uh, to a more sophisticated model that does a better job than, than, than my approach does at explaining the behavior that we actually observe. The, on the second uh, point, I think <coughs> I make a, a very uh, limited point about state interests, which is it seems to me that one should not, whatever state interests are, and I agree, they're hard to define, and it's, it's not a problem that I can resolve, but whatever the assumptions one makes, one shouldn't make the assumption that states have an interest that is a preference or an interest in complying with international law. You know, that, that just solves the problem by fiat. It's like saying, you know, the reason people are able to cooperate is that they like cooperating with each other. Well, if that's the case, you know, why don't people cooperate all the time rather than sometimes cooperating and sometimes having disputes? I think that Coe and other people like him um, are, are argue, you know, they're, they're not very systematic. I mean, it's the problem. It's, it's hard to figure out exactly what they're saying, but uh, my impression is with Coe is that he thinks, so he, he's, he's, not, he's not just saying, well, states like international law. He's saying um, that the individuals within states, you know, over time become habituated to complying with it. You know, it, maybe it enters into their utility functions. Maybe, you know, there's some other mechanism. But it's all very uh, speculative. And doesn't actually get you very far because it's 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 not it's it's uh, not testable. Now I you know I'm all for you know converting the world into Sweden um, uh, if we can do it, but, but that's hard, right? <laughs> that's that's gonna that's gonna take some work. And um, uh, I guess there are two questions here. One is is entering into lots of treaties 
of the sort that Sweden likes, is, is that the way to uh, convert the world into, uh, you know, 192 Swedens? I think, you know, that approach has been tried with the human rights regime, which hasn't worked very well. So uh, something more sophisticated has to be said about um, how one changes states' interests. And, and, you know, you can, one can come up with ideas. Migration, you know, lots of migration, you know, maybe that changes the interests of states, maybe for the better, but maybe for the worse. Um, uh, economic development, maybe giving foreign aid and helping states develop, that'll change their interests. You know, maybe they'll become, as people become wealthier, they'll be less willing to engage in war or more, more able to uh, monitor governments and resist uh, human rights atrocities. Those things don't really have much to do with international law. Those, those, are, those are broader questions. Uh, one of the, well, the, uh, but there may be some interesting uh, uh, there may be some interesting consequences from international law. And here, one possible mechanism might, uh, might be socialization, which is to say, I do think that there is something to the uh, argument that, for example, Anne Marie Slaughter and others have made about the ways in which these networks, at least within the European Union, of judges effectively uh, helped to persuade people to uh, you know so to to take European law seriously in the way that they might not have otherwise done. And I know that there certainly has been uh, some quite careful uh, empirical work done, by, for example, by Jeff Chackel on the way that on sort of states, on states membership of the Council of Europe and how it is that state officials get sucked in to actually um, sort of, uh, at least to some extent, perhaps internalizing norms, first of all, treating them in a hypocritical fashion, you know, sort of giving them lip service, but then through, uh, uh, through the process of um, sort of continually engaging actually beginning to um, sort of uh, take them seriously and in a certain sense to go native and to become, uh, to become uh, sort of encompassed in the institutional frameworks that they initially um, sort of were uh, only participating in pretty gingerly. So uh, I, I, I think that you're correct when you argue that the European Union model cannot be generalized across the world. Uh, there is some interest, there are, that said, some interesting efforts in Asia. Uh, Japan is certainly um, sort of thinking about trying to do this on a regional level in a more serious uh, manner than it has in decades uh, under, the new, um, under the new government. But uh, the extent to which that's going to work out, I think, is very much uh, an open question. But you can see ways in which uh, creating um, sort of dense networks of uh, international uh, interaction, which can indeed include uh, international courts of one sort or another, can actually affect the ways in which uh, judges behave. Another good example of this is the uh, European Court of Human Rights, which you refer to, uh, where you do see... I think some, you know, so some interesting socialization effects are happening, uh, perhaps somewhat limited, uh, but I think that there's something there. I think this is, a, you know, this is a great um, area for, for research. What, what bothers me about it, uh, what, what's been done so far, is that, um, you know, it's very hard to understand what exactly the mechanism is. What is the theory? I, 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 I agree with you, you know, about the European Union. I think it's, it's a very, it's a fascinating case, and I can understand why people with the Europeans themselves in particular, would look at it and, and, and say, look, you know, it's happening here. Uh, it, can, it can happen globally. But, but we, need to know, we need to understand um, just exactly what the mechanism is. I, I'm, I'm myself a little more skeptical about this view, which is very much um, entrenched in the political science literature, that the judges were instrumental in uh, uh, unification of Europe. I think it was a broader phenomenon than that. I think it was an elite phenomenon. The judges, in fact, although they did, you know, crucially um, take the initiative in enforcing um, national governments to comply with European law, they also blocked um, a lot of the steps in uh, European uh, unification. They, uh, in, in several instances, the constitutional courts of the country said, you know, so, sorry, uh, this violates the Constitution. And what happened there was not that the government said, "Ooh, what a relief!" You know, finally, you know, we we can we can we can uh, evade the, the you know the, the, the coils of of, 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 the, of the Rome Treaty. They said, "Oh, okay, well, let's change the law, right?" Which is what they did. And and so it, it was it wasn't the judges. I mean, it was of course the judges were important, but it wasn't just the judges. It was really you know the judges really did um, act within a group of and powerful elites who had a very strong interest in uh, in, in unification of, of some sort. But you know that said, I, you know I think this is this is this is interesting. But you know 
countries have unified before, right? Uh, the European Union is, is not the only example in the, in, in the world. Uh, the, the one of the the great but, sources. But do, do, of, do, do, um, do you really think? Sorry, the, go ahead. Do you really think the union, the European Union, is becoming a state? I think that's. Hard. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm stating the, the most powerful case against my view. I, yeah. I, 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 I um, you know, I don't. I, I thought methodologically. I, I don't want to poo-poo the, the European Union and say, oh, well, that's an, uh, all an illusion. And mm -hmm. I, I do think that a general type of some sort of integration has occurred exactly along the lines that you have described. Um, I have no idea whether it'll eventually become a state. I would certainly not describe it as a state right now. I, I don't want to say one way or the other whether, you know, it's going to become a state or it's not or it's going to fall apart. I think right now people tend to be pessimistic. Well, you know, they were pessimistic and now Ireland is going along and they're more optimistic and, you know, you know who knows? It's a complicated uh, uh, a situation. But but the only point I, was, I wanted to make, mm -hmm. uh, Henry, was that, um, the, you know, the unification has occurred in the past. Um, you know, Germany, Italy, uh, the United States... And, and these were not all harbingers of, of global unification. They were the opposite, right? They, they uh, certainly Germany, you know, uh, they created new sources of instability in the world because although now people at a, at a local level were able to cooperate since they were in a nation rather than in a group of city-states and duchies and so forth, um, they started fighting with, 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 with other, na with other nation-states. Um, so... So that's why it's it's important to understand what the mechanism is. If there's some limit on scale, for example, it may mean it may be that yes, Europe can integrate to some extent, and maybe you know some countries in in um, in East Asia can integrate to some extent, and maybe Latin America, although <laughs> that seems as unlikely as ever. Uh, and so that we might have regional regional blocks. But you know, one of the points I make in the book is that in fact the um, the trend seems to be, if you if you take a long enough perspective in the opposite uh, direction, that the world, the, the the important exception of Europe aside, the world seems to be fag fragmenting rather than uh, rather than unifying, which which I find uh, uh, deeply uh, worrying. Well, uh, the, just to get back to the first point, I actually think that the strongest counterargument against your thing is not if Europe becomes a state. Uh, with the uh, belligerence and whatever that's associated with the state, but if it remains something like what it is, which is to say a union which is clearly stronger in very important ways than the traditional international organization, and where you do have the doctrine of direct effect, effect uh, effectively saying that European law under many circumstances has supremacy over national law, but in which it never assumes the other trappings of a traditional state. And I think that there's an interesting argument to be made that uh, that is, in fact, what's happening, and that the European Union is, in a certain sense, trying to extend that forward. And here, again, this is somewhere where we uh, sort of disagree about the interpretation of a particular event. You have a brief aside in the book about uh, a recent case in the European Court of Justice, which effectively goes against the United Nations Security Council. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is this uh, case over uh, these lists which were being uh, kept of people who are engaged in uh, sort of money transfers, who are viewed as being suspic suspicious because they might have terrorist links of one sort or another. And the European Court of Justice in this case, after uh, being advised by its, uh, or by its, uh, its uh, sort of, the, uh, I'm not going to go into the uh, whole, whole uh, rig and roll, but effectively the European Court of Justice decided that this indeed, um, sort of that, that European law here superseded international law. And you interpret this as the Europeans basically doing what the U.S. are doing, which is to say um, sort of adopting a pretty unilateralist approach to uh, what international law is or is not. If it suits us, great. If not, then not so good. But I think that the, it's um, interesting to look at the specific way in which that judgment was reasoned, because I think that points to a very different plausible interpretation, which is that the European Union, uh, the Court of Justice, did not argue did not argue uh, the kinds of ways that one might expect American jurists who are uh, skeptical of international law to argue. Instead, what it said was that the problem with the UN Security Council uh, system was that it didn't satisfy basic legal principles of, uh, of fairness. In, in particular, that there wasn't any possibility for recourse, there wasn't any um, sort of obvious co uh, possibility for appeal. If you found yourself one of these, on one of these lists, that was it, um, sort of unless you manage uh, by um, sort of sheer luck to persuade um, sort of one of the governments, well, maybe you shouldn't be on it, and somehow manage to get it through that way, you were stuck in it, and there wasn't any um, sort of formal um, sort of right of appeal or anything associated with that.
Now, this also, uh, I have to say, is re- in response to some pressure that the European Court of Justice got from the German Constitutional Court. But really what this seems to me to be doing is uh, rather than trying to uh, establish, you know, sort of upward, you know, sort of this belligerent uh, approach to the outside world that um, sort of you might get with armies or this unilateralist interpretation of the law, what it seems to me to be trying to do is to pressure members of the European Union who are also members of the Security Council only to adopt uh, uh, forms uh, that are uh, binding, which adhere to the basic principles of legal fairness that the European Court of Justice feels are the answer, the minimum that are uh, acceptable under the circumstances. So, in, in, in other words, this seems to me to be more about a um, sort of a vision, uh, trying to extend outwards a vision of international law, which is perhaps compatible with, with what the global legalists want to see rather than uh, sort of being the uh, kind of reversion to type that you seem to be uh, worried about happening here. Yeah, I, I guess I disagree with that. I mean, there, there, you, make, you make a couple of points. One point which I do want to put off to the side, which I do agree with, is that this is a way of, of trying to discipline France and Britain, which are on the Security Council, which is kind of anomalous, uh, but um, – uh, and to, to try to persuade them when they act on the when they're on the security to, uh, uh, council to act in the interests of Europe as a, as a whole, not not just in their own interest or whatever it is that they were trying to accomplish. But you know the bottom line, um, uh, Henry, is that these norms of due process are European norms. I mean, of course, they're American norms as well, but they're European norms. They're not they're not global norms. They're not um, part of international law. In any, you know, in any, well, in any meaningful sense, there was a possible argu- argument open to them, which went as follows: that the Security Council violated international law by um, issuing uh, this, uh, this, re- well, by issuing the resolution that ultimately produced this this order. But the, but they didn't make that argument. But they all they said is that this that this um, because this uh, complying with this resolution would violate. Uh, would violate European law, um, European uh, member states are not allowed to comply with it. Now, it might seem benign, you know, if you, if you think that these norms are good, then it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's just like all these other examples of international law violations. Let's say the intervention in Kosovo. We don't like the UN security, we don't like the UN charter anymore, you know, but we like it, but we're not going to comply with it when it leads us to do things that violate our values. Even you now, even when those values are attractive, uh, attractive to you or attractive to people in general, the fact is is that they're violating international law. It may be justified, morally justified. This is a point I've, I've made over and over again that uh, one shouldn't comply with international law mechanically. And there, but it seems to me that you making an argument about, about values, I'm making an argument about interests. Well, you know, I understand interests more broadly to include both. Mm-hmm. You know, becoming wealthier and and and, and enhancing security and uh, vindicating whatever you know moral and ideological commitments uh, that, that that the state has. So from that perspective, it's a lot like you know, it's as though suppose you know this happens a lot in, in the UN. Usually not at the level of law, but the UN will say, say the General Assembly will say, well, you know, defamation of religion is bad, or the 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 Human Rights uh, Council will say defamation of religion was bad, and so do X, Y, and Z. And the United States says, sorry, you know, that violates our, our First Amendment uh, commitments. We're not going to do it. Well, the world gets annoyed with the United States for doing that, just as when they get the annoyed with the United States for doing other things. Uh, the, the bottom line is that's not how international law is supposed to work. You're supposed to suppress your values, right? You're cooperating with these other countries, which have different values from yours. And when you make this agreement, you're supposed to comply with the agreement, not reassert uh, your values when the agreement leads you to, t- to take actions that, that are inconsistent with them. So, so, you know, it's easy to see Europe as a more benign presence than the United States from a kind of a general liberal perspective. You know, certainly under the Bush administration, you know, that's kind of a plausible uh, thing to think. But, but that's not actually uh, – that's not that – being liberal sometimes means violating the law, not, not complying with it. Okay. Well, maybe this is – I think this is useful because I think this gets to uh, – it, it gets from the uh, – where we started, which is the question of – which is really an empirical question, which is a question about can international law work or can it not, to the, uh, to the um, normative question of should we obey international law and under what circumstances. And it, it seems to me that – 
we want, and this is also something that I, uh, I, I'm not singling this out as a specific criticism for you, uh, of you, because it seems to me that international law covers a multitude of different uh, for international formal institutions, which are, sometimes have quite different logics behind them. Uh, but uh, I guess, let, 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 me, let me just put it this way. So I think that there is a good pragmatic case for international law uh, under some circumstances. I don't think this is a general case. I think there are lots of aspects of international law which are deeply problematic. But let me just state what I, what I think. First of all, the, uh, the UN Security Council uh, doesn't have the same kinds of legitimacy, and this um, sort of gets back to some of the arguments that you make, that you might expect to have uh, uh, emanating from a domestic court. And I think Eric Wooten, um, Eric Wooten is very good on this. I don't know if you're familiar with his work yeah, on uh, uh, you, 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 Yeah, you know his work on the uh, mm-hmm. European Court of Human Rights, I'm mm-hmm. sure. But he also has a very nice piece on the UN Security Council, more or less arguing, well, if the UN Security Council is legitimate in an international sense, it is not legitimate in the sense that... Uh, we um, sort of customarily use that word. It's legitimate because it prevent, presents us with a uh, plausible picture of what minimum it is that the great powers are able to agree on. So, so something that's illegitimate in the sense that it goes against the UN Security Count, uh, Council resolution isn't necessarily illegitimate in a more fundamental sense, but it's going to be problematic from the point of view of achieving international cooperation of one sort or another. I think that, although Eric doesn't phrase it quite this way, uh, you know, so the, case, the case for ad- adhering to UN Security Council resolutions is a pragmatic case rather than a, a sort of deeply grounded normative case. So, that's a, you know, the, so, so, so in other words, uh, and I guess it's talking to a specific issue, I don't think that it's necessarily all that much of a problem when uh, somebody says, well, the, uh, this or that UN Security Council resolution is not, in fact, normatively legitimate, and we will not comply with it on these reasoned normative grounds. Uh, but I also think that there's a case, a pragmatic case, for more international law under specific circumstances, which is to say, when we get things like the uh, this particular um, sort of regime of uh, regime of 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 of, of, of uh, creating a, a list of um, sort of uh, of presumed terrorist organizations. There's a very great temptation for states to oh, to exceed to the bounds that are laid down for them by their domestic legislatures, by their dom- and, and here I'm talking about democratic states, by their dom- domestic democratic systems. And it's exceedingly difficult to actually um, sort of to actually discipline states which do this stuff. You know, the obvious example of this, which is much more extreme, that you talk about in the book is extraordinary rendition, where you get states effectively directly cooperating with each other in order to ship off people to be tortured in ways which are manifestly illegal under domestic law. So you get this um, sort of realm of international cooperation springing into existence, becoming, I think, ever more and more important. I think Anne-Marie Slaughter is right on this. But this is happening without very much in the way of legal bounds on what ca- what particular states can or cannot do. You can imagine that there might be possible ways in which you might restrain the state domestically, but this is going to be hard, <coughs> especially when it comes to, when it comes to things like, uh, like this particular uh, regime that was uh, uh, th- this regime of this uh, money laundering list. Uh, uh, and I think that it's plausible that you would like to see democratic states uh, cooperating together in a limited way to try and come up with some sort of more democratic procedures uh, whereby they can uh, sort of bind themselves so that individual states don't exceed the bound, bounds which are set out for them by their, uh, by their individual, um, you know, by their, their democratic systems uh, in actually um, sort of going out there and doing things which are, you know, sort of using the possibilities which are offered by various forms of international cooperation to do things which are of dubious legality or which are positively illegal under their domestic law. Does well, that make sense? You know, I don't think you're a global legalist, first of all. But, uh, yeah. you know, that's there's a lot there. Um, I, I agree with your pragmatism, you know, and, <coughs> and that uh, one's moral values should um, inform how one perceives international law, uh, various types of international law, some of which are great, some are bad, you know. It, it all depends on the circumstances. A lot of international law that seems great at, at the beginning turns out to have unintended consequences. You know, this is a less sophisticated version of, of your point. I'm not sure about the, you know, the limiting it to democracy. See, I think this is this really goes to the mm-hmm. heart of the problem. 
So taking the perspective of the international lawyer, the whole point of international law is to address the problem that states have highly divergent interests and values. And you have to figure out some way to cooperate with authoritarian states like, like China, of course, and, and Russia. Um, we have a lot of mutual interests with these other countries, stopping uh, global warming, trade, and so forth. And we can't just say to them, well, you know, you're not a democracy. And I sometimes get the sense that Slaughter may or may, you know, might think this. You're not a democracy, so, you know, the rules don't really apply to you. You know, we can break the rules with you. You can't do that. That, that's why you know that's why we have this modern positive positivist version of international law as opposed to the original version going back centuries which was this sort of natural law idea that states have to you know comply with international morality whatever mm -hmm. that is and international morality just happens to be you know and we're going to call international morality more or less or some version of it international law but that doesn't work because people are never really do, able to agree about what international morality is or at least as a practical matter, you have so many states which take, you know, perhaps because they, uh, they uh, you know, they're not democratic and they exploit their people, or perhaps not because they have the enthusiastic support of their people, but they simply repudiate everything that we deeply uh, b believe in. Now, we've got to either cooperate with those guys uh, or not. Now, I think we're in agreement that one wants to take a pragmatic attitude to these problems and cooperate when one generally, you know, does good things and, and not cooperate in order to do uh, bad things. And there's a worry, and, and this is also one of the things you said, that uh, this is a somewhat off to the side, but it's a significant worry that, you know, democratic states with liberal values will sometimes do at an international level things that they wouldn't do domestically, usually because the executives aren't subject to as much constraint at the international level, and so they're freer to do things, and in some cases they can accomplish stuff that, you know, otherwise they would do domestically um, through these international means. You know, th that, though, that particular point is is a problem for international law. It's not, it, it doesn't support international no, law. It means that okay, executives have to be constrained by courts, which, make inter which will make international law, both making international law and uh, complying with international law more difficult than, than it would otherwise be. Um, I, well, I guess there is, as I say, uh, part of the problem for me, and this may just be a simple conceptual problem on my part, is that it's very hard for me to, you know, international law to me, as I understand the way that it, the term is used in, uh, by legal scholars, seems to cover a multitude of different things. It covers the answer to that minimum, which we can agree with, agree on globally as a sort of a minimal effective uh, set of norms which all states ought to adhere to, given their uh, grossly, gross, often grossly divergent uh, sets of values, uh, different legal systems and whatever. It can encompass uh, bilateral treaties. It can c encompass multilateral organizations of one sort or another. And I think uh, we clearly both agree on the possible danger here, which is to say that under – and, you know, this may be in, in a certain sense to – you can reinterpret this using your language as, a, as one form of international law – against another, which is to say that uh, when the U.S. can, for example, cooperate with a, a country with a notoriously bad human rights record such as Syria, and then effectively ship people off to Syria to be tortured so that evidence uh, and information can possibly be extracted from them, uh, this is uh, perhaps uh, legitimate under one sense of international law. It also allows the U.S. to evade, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, to evade its domestic law, but I guess the answer, the point that I'm making here is that that uh, it, it 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 would seem to me that from a pragmatic perspective that uh, democratic countries and in particular the parliaments and the uh, voting populations of democratic countries would be better served if those countries effectively uh, had some clear bounds placed on the kinds of cooperation that they can, can engage with uh, engage in not only with uh, authoritarian regimes but also sometimes with each other in pursuit of these objectives. You know, so, so, <coughs> yeah, well, I, I think that, yeah. um, you, you know, you're making an, an important point which, which touches on, um, you know, yet another part of the, of, of, the, of the literature. I mean, you know, international law, international law has a, you know, a narrow legal definition, and then it's used more casually, uh, publicly, um, and... Um, so when you talk about – so two points. First of all, I think the 
if, if we don't like, you know, these guys being shipped off to Syria, I don't think there's really much of a legal argument to make. It's, it's a moral argument. You, you just say to the government, this is wrong, we disagree with it, please stop. And, and one of the sources of global legalism is the effort to turn that moral argument into a legal argument. Because, you know, legal arguments sound better, they sound sort of more neutral and so forth. This has been going on domestically for 200 years in the United States. So lawyers, lawyers are used to it. But, but, but there's a difference between moral and legal arguments. And sometimes you can only say to another country or to our own government, you're acting immorally. You know, we're, we're unhappy with it. And in the case of our own government, we put pressure on them and throw them out of office. And in the case of foreign governments, all we can really do is put pressure on our government to put pressure on the foreign governments. And, and you know, that's, that's it. But the step that I, that I don't like, that I disagree mm -hmm. with, and that a lot of the global legalists make is to say, well, actually, it turns out that our moral values here are actually already incorporated in, in international law. And you know, this argument you know, can always be made because it's just like saying, well, I think I have a constitutional right to abortion, or you know, there's a constitutional rule that says you can't have an abortion, or you know, because I interpret these vague um, uh, uh, phrases of the Constitution in the in, in the follow, following ways. That sort of argument. What do we actually have? We have these very weak human rights treaties that are extremely vague that these authoritarian states signed in the first place, some of them anyway, because you know they say things like, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna sign this treaty, but we interpret all of the terms so that they're consistent with Sharia, right? I mean, what is what does that mean? Um, the, the, the treaties are deliberately vague. They're deliberately uh, – uh, states are able to um, make their own interpretations of them. The states deliberately fail to make meaningful institutions to interpret and enforce uh, the treaties. So we don't have uh, a real court the way we do in, in domestically, a legitimate court, to, to, to uh, uh, resolve the disagreements. And, and I think what one has to do is just frankly acknowledge that a lot of international relations is just a bunch of moral arguments going back and forth. And to admit that rational states, you know, run by intelligent people who have survived a lot, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to, they're engaging in torture and other things like that because they think that's the way to stay in power and that's the, you know, that's what they got to, that's what they have to do. They're not going to stop it just because somebody says it's, it's against the law. And and we're stuck. You know, we can we can try to sanction them and, and isolate them, but that has costs. And we you know, we can try to cooperate them and try to get them to change their behavior. That doesn't always doesn't always uh, work very well, very well. But just you know this this law stuff. I mean, as long as you understand that it's rhetorical, fine. You know, use the terms. But 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 to, but anything beyond that, uh, you know, is just muddying the waters and 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 is not getting at uh, what's really going on in these situations. Well, I think we probably should close because we're a little bit over the hour now, but uh, I think it's been a very useful conversation, at least for me. I've... Yes, uh, me too, Henry. Thank you. I, I appreciate your uh, taking the trouble to read the book, and, and, uh, and I thought your uh, questions and comments were, were extremely acute and helpful. So, so thanks very much. Thank you.